Okay, greetings everyone. My name is Oliver Kaplan. I'm a professor at the Joseph Corbell School at the University of Denver, where I'm also the director of our Latin America Center. And I'd like to welcome you all for joining us today for our event. We are continuing with our speaker series on health and race in the Americas. And today we have the very good fortune to have a presentation by Professor Alejandro Fajed on using big data to inform decision-making on COVID-19 in Colombia. And again, if 2020 has taught us anything, it's clear that especially here in the United States, we have a lot to learn from other places around the world. So we're extremely fortunate to have Professor Fahed with us to share some of his uh, research findings. I'd also just like to mention that our first event went off great uh, last month. We had a talk by Professor Diana Senor Angulo from Costa Rica on portraits of Astro, uh, excuse me, of Afro Costa Rican citizenship. Uh, and that is now available on YouTube and I will be sharing the link to that video for those of you who uh, couldn't catch it the first time. I'd also just like to mention that we are now as a Latin America Center nested under the new Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies. And we have a new website for that uh, umbrella center. We also have a new website for our Latin America Center. So I will also be later sharing that in the, the chat box as well. So you can check out those links. And before I introduce our speaker, I would like to just briefly give a thanks to Gina Janone, Rose Quispe, and uh, Anna Metropolis for helping to uh, put this event together behind the scenes. So thank you very much for all your assistance and support. And so now I'd like to introduce our speaker, Professor Alejandro Fahed. Dr. Fahed is an ecological anthropologist in the Urban Management and Development Department in the School of Political Science, Government, and International Relations at the Universidad de Rosario in Bogota, Colombia. He holds a PhD from Stanford University, as well as a master's degree from the Universidad Heveriana. And I think this presentation is just so timely, especially th this week as COVID cases are, sp are spiking here in the United States, here in Colorado, as well as around the world. I think we need all the lessons we can. And before I turn it over to Alejandro, I'll just say that Alejandro is actually a good friend of mine from way back. We actually went to grad school together at Stanford University. And uh, you know, even though he's an anthropologist and I'm a political scientist, somehow we managed to get along. And in fact, uh, Alejandro, I think was the first, maybe one of the first people to help introduce me to Colombia and get familiar with Colombia for my research. And so, you know, even though I was skeptical, about our friendship, it does turn out that you know interdisciplinary friendships are possible. So really great uh, to have you here with us, Alejandro. Hopefully someday in Denver, but for now we have you online. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Fahed for his presentation. And uh, in terms of the format, he'll speak for probably about thirty minutes. We'll have um, uh, then we'll turn it over for audience Q and A, and you can put your questions into the chat box, and we'll make sure that we get answer as many as we can. So, with that, over to you. Thank you, Oliver, and thank you for the invitation. It's an honor for me to be here and share um, the research that we have been doing as our group. Um, so, I'm going to share screen for the slides that I prepared. Uh, please let me know if you. Okay, are you, are you, is it full screen now? It's, I think you need to select that, that particular window in the share, because it's only showing the, it's showing your whole desktop. Okay. <laughs> uh, That's, or, or, or expand the screen. Um, maybe uh, enter full screen from the view there. Like this? Oh, that that works too. <laughs> okay, I'm just I won't fight with technology. Um, so um, I'm going to share uh, some of the work we've been doing uh, in the context of the pandemic uh, here in Colombia. Uh, we've been using technology and uh, some data to help uh, the decision making processes of of public health uh, in in the context of of the pandemic here. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, work that has, it's, it's a collaborative effort. Uh, it's an interdisciplinary effort. Uh, it includes lots of people from different backgrounds. 
Um, I'm speaking here on their behalf or representing them, but it's an honor for me to represent this team because it's a group of brilliant people and uh, some of them are here uh, in the audience uh, right now. Uh, and also because I'm in a uh, place that has a little bit of uh, internet shortages every now and then. So uh, if I suddenly disappear, uh, they will take over. And I know that they will, they know the project uh, even better than I do <laughs> because uh, they do all the fun work and I sometimes uh, have to go to meetings. So uh, I know that they will uh, share all the messages that I was going to share with you. Um, we have people from economics, from um, theoretical biology, from mathematics, um, computer scientists, mathematics, um, uh, and uh, geneticists, and, and a person that is from the public policy sector, from, she's a practitioner. And I think this, and this, this is a huge enrichment for the work that we've been trying to do. Uh, and what we've been trying to do is basically connect uh, research to um, public policy, which is, uh, I'm going to talk to you, um, that's like the main message that we want to convey today. Um, so I start here by saying that we, we've known uh, uh, certain aspects that are crucial to understanding the pandemic very early, uh, since very early in the pandemic, since January, we found out that this was a pandemic that has, it presents um, a, a, an unusual trait in, uh, in infectious diseases, which is uh, super spreaders. This is something what we saw beforehand in, in previous pandemics in, in, this, in the first coronavirus pandemic. And it's something that is very crucial to address, to understand to, and to properly address uh, the, the like public health interventions. We know this since January, February, um, further later, uh, the next month, we still knew about it, but it's been really, really hard to get people to integrate this type of uh, knowledge into the decision making process of coping with the pandemic. And so um, as the news goes on, as more and more evidence uh, comes out that this are crucial aspects to understand the pandemic. We still have uh, uh, what I think is a paradox. Um, yesterday, we woke up to this extraordinary article that uh, I think many of you may have seen because it's been featured like all around the news, all the news uh, sites and um, news outlets have been uh, commenting on this type of article. and. Um, on, on this article, and I think it's one of the, it's, it's going to be an article that has a lot of impact in how we uh, go about our lives uh, in the new, in this new normality that the, that the pandemic has brought upon us. Um, but before before this happens, like I, I, I just wanna comment on, on one particular thing, and it's, this is um, a bibliographic, um, these are some bibliographic metrics about the pandemic. So this is all the all the academic production of um, COVID-19 in the literature. And if you see the countries that have produced the most number of articles and research are also some of the countries that have been worse hit by the pandemic. And so um, why, why is this happening? Uh, and this is like the message that I want to convey here is that we as social scientists, as we, we need to engage more because this is not a problem. The, the pandemic, controlling the pandemic is not a problem of, of just natural sciences, of just the basic sciences. We need, we have a lot of information, but we have not been able to use it. And if, if we ask why, why has this happened? I think all of us have like a couple of culprits in, in mind. Um, we have obviously uh, one of the things that has been very clear about how to properly address the pandemic is we need very clear messages from, from the politicians, from the scientific community, from the public health officials. And that has not been going on in a lot of countries. 
And so uh, I don't know if you've um, if you follow this account on Twitter, I I, I highly recommend it because um, I think that one of the biggest challenges in this pandemic has been addressing with the lack of information or the disinformation campaigns. Some people are actively uh, trying to could confuse people as to what is the proper way to, to behave and to, to prevent infection in the pandemic. Uh, so this has been um, all around all sorts of news outlets, uh, social networks. This, I, this is by no means an exhaustive um, um, co a collection of, of memes, uh, but, but uh, if, if I think we have all seen and enjoyed very much um, the, the like the comical aspect of 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 the pandemic, in in that like in in that in in this in this crazy situation that we're all living in, we 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 find a lot of um, a lot of I don't know reactions that that we find difficult to cope with, right? Um, so, uh, as as I, men as I mentioned before, what what are we doing? Uh, we are trying to improve these decision making uh, processes, uh, trying to connect research from from basic science and uh, from the natural sciences, from um, from uh, social network theory, uh, from computer science. We've been trying to connect this to decision making processes. Um, so how do we do this? We are basically producing a number of reports. Uh, we have been producing national and subnational reports, and we've been doing some custom-made reports for other subnational entities uh, that uh, are trying to cope with the pandemic as well. There, how how are they dealing with it? Um, we of course, Colombia is a middle-income country, but it's the income is very heterogeneous and so we find some regions that really do not have access to to um, good quality information in, in to or at least in in the same way that other uh, municipalities or regions within Colombia have access to, to the same type of information. So for this we have built two pipelines. Uh, a pipeline is basically a process like a sequence of algorithms that lets you collect, store, um, clean, process, and analyze data. And so we've been using these two pipelines. Um, one comes from, from Facebook data. We have, um, we, we use uh, GeoInsights, which is uh, part of like their um, data for good initiative, the um, uh, data that Facebook has made available to researchers all around the world uh, for specifically for these uh, crisis uh, management uh, situations. And we're also using a pipeline that fits on um, uh, information based on uh, Unicast data, which is um, basically information that comes from um, from uh, mobile ads. So applications, uh, there's aggregators of content uh, that basically buy information from different sources, from different applications, from uh, different uh, online, <clears throat> online marketing um, uh, resources. And so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that later. So um, so Facebook Geo Insights, it means uh, it, the, the type of the data we're using, it runs on a local computer. It's about 95 gigabytes worth of data um, and it's processed by approximately 13,000 lines of code. Um, this is for uh, the national level reports. Uh, and then we have the, the uh, local more um, micro level uh, um, data that we've been using. It, it, uh, we've been following individual uh, mobile phones uh, with uh, data that is commercially available. That is, uh, it, it abides the, um, the regulations of the European Union on, on uh, mobile phone data. And uh, these are data sets that are commercially available. 
and these are huge data sets we have we have access to about like five terabytes of the uh, worth of data and we this is something that cannot be run on a local computer so we resort to online resources such as google cloud platform which uh, is where we are hosting all this data at the moment so just to give you a, a, an overview of the processes that we uh, that these uh, pipelines involve, uh, so we are the, the input that they receive is uh, on, in the case of the Facebook pipeline, it receives cases um, you're referenced and it receives um, polygons, the uh, polygons of uh, units of that we are analyzing, but also it receives uh, polygons in terms of the vectors that uh, or which movement is observed in in uh, by by facebook facebook produces this as uh, i don't know if you're familiar with uh, shape files or but we basically observe vectors along which people uh, are moving and we we have this is aggregated data and uh, we basically know how many people move from place a to place b uh, and this process, uh, the, the type of outputs that we have is uh, we can we can know how how many people moved from one place to another. We also know how many people moved within a place, and we also have access to the cases uh, through different uh, online resources. And so, with all this, we do um, we combine this into. Um, so uh, basically, uh, first, before going into the type of output that we produce, uh, this is the this is the flow or the um, uh, yeah flow diagram that describes these processes. So we extract the data, we unify it, we agglomerate it. So um, probably you have seen um, some literature regarding uh, mega regions, which is. Uh, um this new uh, framework under which uh, we are beginning to question how administrative boundaries don't phenomena that we're trying to address uh, through public policy so we need to better understand like our definition of cities of uh, settlements and uh, using this type of data we can aggregate data so that we don't have for example and I don't know, I'm going to say something that uh, may be familiar, may be mistaken, but uh, uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn and New Jersey, they, they may operate as, as, a, as a single unit in, for, for the purpose of, of the virus, of viral transmission. So we want to aggregate these units into something that makes sense in terms of the social pheno phenomena that we are trying to, to address. So this type of uh, pipeline builds this type of, of regions so that we don't have to be studying uh, isolated things that may not uh, allow us to see the forest, right? Because uh, when we're looking at individual trees, sometimes we are not looking at, at the big picture. And this is definitely something that we want to keep an eye on. So this is the type of output that we, that we have from the, from the pipeline, we extract data from all around the world uh, from uh, well through Facebook we have access to data from all around the world uh, and uh, we also um, extract data from from websites where governments provide information about the the locations and the, of the cases that they have and so with this information we train some models and these models um, help us better understand our local outbreaks comparing to outbreaks that are happening elsewhere. So we train some models to better understand our local dynamics with epidemics that may be far ahead, uh, for example, on the second or third wave, because uh, we in Colombia, we're now on, on the second wave of, of the coronavirus on the, on the second peak or so-called, you know, um, the second pipeline that we have, uh, as I was mentioning, it involves analyzing uh, micro level data. So we are basically following individual devices that represent normally movement of individuals. And so we, the type of input that we give to this pipeline is a spatial polygon. So it can be 
uh, something that we, that, that we describe as a city or uh, um, um, a county, or it can be even smaller than a county. These data are used, for example, to decide where should I, uh, where should I set up a new Starbucks, for example. That's the type of questions that these data are used for uh, commercially in the industry. So it's very granular. It can give us an understanding of, of very small polygons in space. And so out of these polygons, we can do uh, contact networks, which is similar, it's analogous. It's, it does not replace and it, it's a little bit different, but it's analogous to digital contact tracing. Um, and we, with these networks of contacts, which are similar to, for example, mention graphs on Twitter. If I mention somebody, then that's, that's a connection. Well, in these networks, we are producing a network in which people are connected to each other if they share uh, the same uh, coordinates at a given time. And so by this, we can uh, produce uh, this type of, of uh, statistics by, um, I'm going to describe them here. So we can see individuals that made transits by different polygons. This is Bogota and this is uh, people, this is one person that went through different polygons. We can see if two people were in proximity and so we can say that they had a contact with, with each other. And we can see paths of movement along uh, different polygons. We also have information about um, where people are spending the night where people are spending most of the day or other places that are frequent, frequently visited by, by each individual. And with this information, we have another layer, which is cases. And so we are able to um, uh, estimate which people are infected based on places where more cases have been confirmed. And so with this, uh, we build a network on which we can study. These are, these are I mean, the, the names may sound technical, but it's basically PageRank is the algorithm that uh, Google uses to, it's part of the, the, I mean, it's a lot more complicated now, but the original algorithm that Facebook, uh, that, that Google used to, to rank uh, the web results uh, is basically uh, this, which is, it's a, it's a measurement of popularity within a network, basically. Again, value, again, vectors, these are very similar. They also describe the, the relative importance of nodes within a network. Degree just refers to the number of, of connections that each person has. A node would be here a, a person or a, a device. Uh, contact, it's the number of, I, I may be connected to, to Oliver, but then, Oliver and I may have 300 contacts uh, uh, and I may have uh, another 200 with somebody else. And this is important to, to better understand the network. We also have some transits. We can measure the transitivity of a network. If A is friends with B and B is friends with C, what's the probability that A is friends with C? Uh, we can calculate movement, uh, the total movement, the interior movement, the external movement. And we can also have some, some measurements of inequality within a network, uh, how much these page rank values uh, vary along uh, time, um, distance to cases, what's the mean number, what's the, what's the mean distance to cases of each individual within the, the network, and some, some other uh, statistics like a parlor test to see if, if, if uh, people with a high number of connections are um, are, it, 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 whether that's a frequent observation, right? whether that's an observation that you can expect like often. And this is important because one of the consequences of having super, super spreaders in, in this pandemic, in this disease, means that most of the transmission is happening by a few individuals or a few uh, super spreading events. So. Uh, it, it varies along, um, depending on which uh, reference you're looking at, but there's a lot, of, um, a lot of reports that say that most of the infections do not lead to secondary infections, but there's very few people that infect a lot of people. So 
we need to adjust our public policy interventions to match this type of, of uh, phenomena that we're observing in this, in this disease. So this is how the network looks. These are the network statistics that we, that we calculate. This is Ibagué, it's um, a small city in Colombia. It's by no means one of the largest, but it's, it's still um, an important city. It's the capital of its, uh, of its department. And um, what you see is all the points in which we think um, super spreading events can be happening. And this is important, why? Because, um, well, this is, this is all the cities and, and countries that we have been studying. We've been incorporating more and more data and the more data we have, obviously, the better we understand this, this, our data and how our data describes uh, um, the pandemic. And so I don't know if you're familiar with urban studies, but there's this field called um, urban acupuncture and it basically means what what, what you would think what, what you think it means it's how can we produce interventions at a uh, at, at a small ter territorial level at a micro territorial level and how can these small interventions have a wider effect in in the whole organism right so we basically have a map for these urban acupuncture uh, interventions in terms of the pandemic. I'm not saying that this is like the ultimate urban acupuncture map, but it's just like, if you're interested in producing interventions for the pandemic, this is a map that will help you understand how, uh, where you should, where you would maximize uh, the effect of those interventions. So we're operating under this type of, um, of um, a framework, uh, uh, we've been doing uh, custom-made uh, uh, processes with custom-made analysis, but we've also been sitting with governments, with uh, the local health authorities, with uh, the mayor, and we've developed this is uh, this is a, uh, an intervention that we developed in Palmira with along with uh, other people uh, that were not part of the team when we began uh, we have an, an urban studies specialist that has been advising us on how to produce interventions that involve culture health uh, economical development i think uh, everywhere in the world there's there's this question on how can we how can we recover some of our life back from the pandemic without risking contracting the disease and making it all worse, right? So this is the question that we got from the mayor uh, himself. He said, listen, I have to do something. People are, people need to open businesses. We need to, we need to open businesses, but we, we have to control it somehow. So we, we've, this is, this is the result of this uh, process that we, uh, did with, with Palmira and with Herman Sarmiento, who is the specialist advising us in this in this uh, special topic. Uh, and so these are the these are some of the interventions that are thought of as uh, urban acupuncture. These are low budget interventions. It doesn't necessarily involve like large infrastructural interventions. Uh, it's low budget investment uh, interventions that um, they have. Uh, the, the, the objective is to produce like a, a different uh, in, uh, inhabitment or I don't know how to call it, the different, um, uh, a different way of interacting with the environment that we have always had there. So uh, by just adding some trees or chairs or some, some of these um, um, small objects or painting the streets in some way, we can have a dramatic change in the way people behave within this environment. And this is precisely the type of thing that we need to do in this, in, 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 during this pandemic, because all of us know by now that we need to avoid crowded places, um, indoor locations, uh, and be places with a lot of contacts, right? So the public space, the, like cities have streets. We have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of outdoor space that we are basically 
um, not using. So uh, we are we're um, in these processes. We're trying to advise cities to repurpose this public space and and use it for for in the context so in the context of the pandemic for for different stuff. This is something that has been going on all around the world. We have examples of uh, slow streets or closed streets that are where people do yoga in, in Brooklyn, in Oakland, in I'm sure that uh, Denver and, and uh, other places in Colorado have also implemented some sorts of these uh, interventions. And these are interventions that are uh, welcomed by the, by the population. And what we do is we measure interventions in terms with, so we, we have a, a quasi experimental design to measure the impact of this intervention. So we are doing policy evaluation. And this is very important, I think. This is a huge contribution that we can have from the social sciences to um, in, in, in the context of this pandemic. Why? Because, because the knowledge is there. We, we know what we need to do to stop the pandemic, right? Some countries have gotten it right. It's not something that is, you don't need, I mean, it's definitely easier for some governments that have some, some sorts of regimes, but we have democracies that have implemented some interventions and that have successfully mitigated the, 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 the pandemic, right? and they have suppressed it. So it's something that can be done. It doesn't necessarily have to involve all the like high tech that we think of only happens in Korea and China. Uh, and this is something that I stress a lot here in Colombia because people normally here in Colombia say like, oh yeah, but that can be done in Korea, but that it's impossible to do that here. And what we're seeing is that we're seeing basically all of the Western countries uh, struggling regardless of their uh, of their wealth, regardless of their access to technology, regardless of the number of articles and research activity that is going on in the context of the pandemic. So we have been doing this type of interventions and we have measured the effect that they have on contacts, on movement and uh, on all the statistics that I was describing. We basically, we do a, this is a very basic policy evaluation framework, which is basically a difference of differences. Uh, so we are, we have a control group and a treatment group and uh, in polygons uh, in this case, and we measure the difference after the intervention on these polygons in terms of, uh, these are actual data from the interventions that you're seeing. Um, this is Palmira, so uh, this is this is all the okay, all the all the neighborhoods or or the counties within Palmira, and we, we can as you can see we this is this is part of the reports that we've been uh, sharing with the um, with the mayor's office, and uh, this, these are the statistics that I was telling you about. This is the information that we've been using to determine whether an intervention has been successful or not, uh, whether it has increased our interest is to produce interventions that increase uh, human mobility without increasing the risk of transmission. And so uh, we, we probably, you probably have heard of this the concept of the 15 minute city. This is the type of, of um, behaviors and inhabiting of the city that we want to promote. We want to promote short trips that don't connect uh, made distant outbreaks. We want to promote people that uh, people to move around in, within their neighborhoods or their immediate surroundings. And uh, uh, this is the movement that we've been observing. So we we can definitely trace this to the to uh, the impact of policies on the networks and on mobility. Uh, for example, this this gap that you see here. This gap. Uh, uh, it, uh, as you can suppose, it, it happened after uh, the lockdown was put in order and then it was lifted and you see this spike and uh, this also happens on the networks. Uh, these are all the people that made a transit through one of the polygons that we've been observing. This is not all of the city, this is just the, the polygons that have been intervened and uh, we have been 
looking at those same statistics for this, and uh, I have this video here. Oh, uh, there it is. So what you what you're seeing is all the contacts derived from people making a transit through one of the polygons that have been under intervention, and then they had contacts elsewhere. So we are measuring, we are able to trace the network of connections, the network of contacts of people that may transit through one polygon. And this can be a university, this can be a restaurant, this can be a factory, this can be like any polygon, any spatial polygon that you can think of. This is the type of, of statistics we can, we can have. And so these are the first six polygons that we've been following in, in Palmira. Uh, and as I was telling you, you can see which ones have been, uh, so for example, this is towards the end, you see these two uh, sports and this is entrepreneurship. This is interventions that have been made to open um, restaurants. And so you see, this is the number of uh, edges on the, on, the, on the network and you see that these two, this is a logarithmic scale. So you can see that these two interventions jumped to a different um, order, order of magnitude in, in terms of the edges that they have. Uh, this health intervention, SALUD stands for health, and uh, you can see that this is a different order of magnitude in general than all of the other polygons that we've been following. And that's because this is, the, this is where we are uh, we're observing, we're following uh, public health interventions in the places that were worst hit by the by the epidemic. So these are uh, this is uh, we're observing one of the one of the hardest hit um, places of the city, but also uh, one of the places of fastest transmission of the virus. And you can see that here. It's, uh, these are the cases associated to each of the networks of each of these polygons. And then we have, sorry, then we have contacts, we have distance to cases. This is not a very good uh, graph at the moment. We're working to improve it. This is the number of nodes involved in each of the polygons. And then this is the personalized page rank Gini, which is um, the risk, the, so, so the larger it is, the, the highest the risk of, of observing super spreading events associated to this particular network. Note that the network does not necessarily have to be located within the polygon, it's just people who transit through the polygon and then we associate, we, we measure the whole network of connections of those people all around the city. So for example, uh, this can be useful in, in the sense that you can follow uh, for example, students of a university, if a university decides to open, um, then a university may be able to track contacts within their polygon, within their, their, their population. But what if those students or the, their community is connected to other communities of other universities or, or other places and maybe engage in risky activities outside of their university then it's important to find out whether a community is exposed to the virus uh, all around, not just within the university, because we obviously know that the virus doesn't, uh, it, that that transmission doesn't happen like that. Um, we are glad to see that uh, this uh, has not increased that dramatically in, in the interventions that, uh, that we've been observing compared to others. I mean, it has been increasing all around, but but it hasn't dramatically improved. It, it hasn't dramatically increased in the interventions that we've been following. And well, transitivity, as you can see, we we are still working on on that. This is the mobility changes associated to each of the polygons that I was telling you about. This is I'm, I'm sharing. This Palmira is our our. Um, uh, like our most advanced example, but uh, we are uh, at the moment implementing this type of interventions in different parts of Colombia. Uh, but this is, uh, that's why I'm talking so much about Palmira. And uh, this is the mobility associated to this type of, of uh, polygons to our interventions. And what you see is, for example, uh, Bosque, which is like 
uh, it would be like the central park of this uh, of this city. And what you see is that even though it has a, a lot of increasing internal movement, uh, it doesn't have a lot of increase in, in all movement. And so we think that this type of, of open door parks and spaces, uh, well, I mean, this may sound really obvious that these are the type of venues or uh, locations that where you want people to be in the context of the pandemic. But it's one thing to suppose it and another one to have evidence and data um, to support the claim that these are the places where people should be hanging out uh, because they don't represent an increase in the risk. And you, by opening them and by allowing people to visit them, you can decrease the impact of, of the non-pharmaceutical interventions such as quarantines and lockdowns and, and these other types of stuff. And just to mention one last thing that we have been combining into this analysis is we look at the genomics of the virus. We, we look at the genomic sequences of each individual virus. And then we can also in, use this information to track super spreading events and to have a molecular confirmation of, of these uh, uh, chains of transmission of the virus because we can trace uh, different viral uh, viral genomes to to um, mobility patterns, and then we can infer if, in fact, there was transmission associated to a particular place, because all of these genomes have uh, the same characteristics, and so we have molecular confirmation of that that we have been observing uh, through this. Um, other uh, different methods of uh, data analysis. This is done in collaboration with a different lab within our university. Uh, the, it's called uh, the Group of uh, Microbiology Research at Universidad del Rosario, and the, the main researcher is Juan David Ramirez. And that's all I had to share for now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fahed. Uh, I thought this was a great uh, introduction to this topic for non-experts, uh, not unlike myself, in learning about new concepts like urban acupuncture, which I think would maybe be good to try at some point. Um, <laughs> uh, and I know one thing we didn't talk about actually was your background was actually in studying malaria uh, transmission and uh, interesting that you were able to kind of adapt your approaches and research to looking at COVID when that, when that came up. Um, and, and greetings to all of the co-authors who were on the call as well. Uh, they look like a fun bunch, so glad to have some of them with us today. Um, I wanted to get into the Q&A. We don't have too much time left. I thought I would do a, a first question myself, but actually um, combine it with a question that we have in the chat from Griffin Taylor. And this is a, I'd like to just go back to some of the policy interventions that you were talking about. Um, and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about like what are some of these specific interventions and is one more effective than another? I mean, you showed the kind of having people maybe spend more time in these large open air parks where people aren't um, inside, you know, able to spread disease as much. Um, are there other interventions that you see as being particularly useful in, in Colombia? And then are any of those things, you know, are there any lessons that you would say, hey, gringos up there, you guys should be doing, you know, X, Y, Z, because this is what we're seeing as, um, as effective. Mm. I think that's a good question. We're, we're in the early stages of this, which is, these data are just coming out of the oven. <laughs> we, this, this, these reports are just beginning to go through to the to mayor's office. So we are at the, at the early stages, we're just beginning to implement them and evaluate their, their efficacy. So the types of interventions are, I mean, it's basically what you saw, um, like outdoor dining, um, trying to open and um, allow people to inhabit parks uh, more often. Um, uh, something that I think is very, I don't think you have that this problem in, in the US because you have an automobile, automobile based uh, um, cities in general, right? So you don't have massive transportation that in, uh, involves a lot of contacts and a lot, like packing a lot of people into a bus or into a, a metro. 
And I think this is one of the things that actually helps the US, but we have a huge problem for that here. And one intervention that in my opinion, but uh, this is a hypothesis at the moment, uh, is that um, it's something that is very basic, but it's devoting uh, corridors or like uh, lanes for, for cyclists. And so people have an alternative transportation that doesn't involve these mass transportation systems that, I mean, uh, they, they, they are just uh, all the things that you want to avoid in the context of a pandemic. And, and not only that, but it also helps in so many other ways, right? If, if you have people mobilizing in a bicycle in a city, this is, this is the type of transformation that we need as humanity to go forward. We need to, to get rid of this uh, transportation based on, 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 on fuels, but also like electricity, like electric cars are not going to solve the problem. And so we need to move towards. So in, in a lot of senses, uh, people from, from all backgrounds, I think have highlighted all the opportunities that this pandemic is bringing upon us with um, in terms of, of just implementing new things that with without the pandemic, this would be very costly politically or, or in, in other. So I don't know if I fully answered okay. the question, but yeah, um, those I are my thoughts. I don't know idea. if Carolina or Felipe have any thoughts on that. I can't see if they're if they're able to comment or not, but uh, why don't we, we have a few more questions in the chat. Why don't we move on to some of okay. these questions? And one of them is from Daniel Cardenas. And he asks uh, that, you, he mentions that Palmira is a especially violent city or has a history of, of violence there. And um, is there any relationship between the presence of armed groups or gangs and the spread of the pandemic that you're able to detect? Or can you account for violence in your modeling? Well, so we don't specifically address violence in our model, but we have been looking at, we know one of the really interesting thing, findings of the, of the article that I was mentioning uh, of, of the US so with similar data, uh, it highlights how low income neighborhoods are in a higher risk of, of, uh, of transmission because A, people, can, can, they cannot reduce their mobility patterns as much as people in, in high income neighborhoods. But also the restaurants and the places that they visit are normally um, uh, more packed. And also, uh, so, so, so people are like, like risk of transmission is, is highly associated to your, to your income. Uh, and in uh, places that have more inequality normally will have more inequality also in the risk of transmission. And so we have been working on interventions in, in the most problematic neighborhoods in, within Palmira. And this is not only by our interest, but we, by, by the interest of the, of the government, of the, of the local authorities. Uh, so it's, it's definitely not only violence, but like, the whole socioeconomic context, I would say, is vital to keep in mind uh, when you have uh, these interventions. And these should be prioritized in like having that in, 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 in mind. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's, that's a great point that you know, inequality is a big, I think, issue around the world with people who, who do have cars and don't have cars, for example, or who need to work on the front lines versus people who can work at home or do a web talk, if you will. So. Um, certainly, you know, those are some, some challenges. Um, we do have another question here from uh, Professor Tim Sisk, who is actually the director of our uh, Institute for Comparative and Regional Studies. And I'm going to adapt it a little bit. But his question was, uh, ha has your analysis review, uh, uncovered any possibly contradictory or conflicting uh, findings or results? Um, and how do you communicate those? Uh, those types of kind of results going in, in two directions. And, and my sort of addition to that is, you know, you've showed us probably six or seven types of interventions that you're looking at. And I'm guessing because you're looking at these polygons as the, the unit of analysis, a lot of the interventions are probably overlapping. 
um, where you have multiple interventions going on in the same place because it's a key node. And are you able to distinguish um, the effects of one intervention versus another, or is it a package of interventions that you're observing? Okay. So actually the interventions are not overlapping so that we haven't had that difficulty, but we, I mean, the, 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 the graphs may, may overlap. So, so the, the graphs that the observed graphs of contacts. Um, the contradictory results, that's, that's a really interesting question. We had this case in which when we were beginning this with another city, I won't mention it so that I, I don't get in trouble, but uh, I, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> so we, we, were, we, we were beginning with a different city, this type of analysis. And, and of course, everyone was like, okay, I mean, this sounds really interesting, but, but do we know that it works? And I mean, I, I had faith in it, but I didn't have any proof that it worked. And so we, we conceived an exercise in which we would, we would find super spreaders with our method, and then we would give a list of those super spreaders to the mayor's office, and they would go back to their, um, to their manual epidemiological records, and they found the, the, the cases that we thought were super spreaders, and they were like textbook examples of super spreaders within the, within the pandemic. So it was like a, a, prison, a, a, a person that works in IMPEC, which is the prison system here in Colombia, um, a nurse, uh, a doctor, uh, um, a bank teller, and uh, someone who worked in a meat packing industry. So like a very high contact Exactly. So these uh -huh. are like the <laughs> uh, renowned super spreaders or super spreading contexts uh, in this pandemic. But because a lot of them were medical related, they said like, we cannot show this to anyone because this, mm -hmm. this would mean that we're not doing our job because people within our hospitals are spreading the disease and this is, we cannot do this. And so this is the type of and, and I think this is one of the key things that we need to address and why I was very interested in giving this talk to, to, to you, uh, to, to this audience, because I think we need to engage more, we need to participate and we need to contribute from the social sciences because we don't, we, the vaccine, we, we don't have to rely only on, on, the, on the basic sciences to, to have a solution because because the basic sciences provide only half of the solution, but the other half is like the social Behavior. context and yeah. the, the 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 most more the, the most complex uh, context of of solving a problem such as this one. Well, so are you able to identify individuals with this data, and are there any you know, kind of human subjects protection concerns that you've been navigating? So that's a, a problem, I mean, that's not a problem. It's a, it's a question that comes out every time I give a talk. And uh, so we, we had to make sure, so we, we went to the source, we went to the provider of the data and they said, listen, we are compliant with the most, with the strictest regulation for, for, uh, for this type of data, which is the European um, mm -hmm. regulation. Um, these are data sets that are commercially available, so I'm not using anything that would not be available to anyone that that would want to go and buy it. I think my take on it is they're already using all this information to sell us hamburgers or <laughs> network <laughs> net, like Netflix subscriptions. So so we might as well use them for a good purpose in this context. Mm -hmm. And within our group, we do try to keep some practices, such as for example. We try ourselves not to have uh, information that is not anonymized in mm -hmm. like from, from public health records, for example. So, yeah. so something that I think works really well to, to keep uh, the security of, of people, the, the, the digital security of individuals is, first of all, we're trying to focus on, even though we follow individuals, we try to base our analysis and our conclusions on, on aggregated analysis, right? So we're, we're looking at uh, aggregated network statistics, and then we, look, we go to places that are uh, likely to have high transmission, right? So we're not 
pinpointing, we're not pointing fingers at individuals. Uh, and also having this uh, data in, in, different, in different places so that no, no stakeholder has access to all the data uh -huh. because uh, I think that's when, when problems arise. And definitely there were some people working with this data here in Colombia that ran into problems. For example, uh, Medellin, I don't know if you've been following, uh, but um, the mayor had the mayor began his own began collecting data on on, on people. They they uh, released an app uh, for doing this, but it, it wasn't clear. I think they didn't think through all the all the details, and I think that's really important. Um, we we have been doing all in our hands to to be cautious about this data, but also as I mentioned, like these data are also compliant of the most strict regulatory uh, laws. Okay. Well, we're almost out of time, but we, we do have one more question for you, uh, Professor Fahed, on yeah. transportation and wondering if the big data tools that you're using maybe can help provide some more specific recommendations for how to deal with these uh, issues with dense, you know, dense usage of public transportation. Um, and I guess one thing that would come to mind, you know, are you able to identify certain corridors with especially heavy usage and maybe recommend, you know, either more bike lanes there or more buses to thin out the crowds um, or, you know, recommend that some personnel are there to advise the, the users on wearing masks and other, other things that might, that might sort of de-densify those, those uh, corridors. That's, I think, uh, that's a really good question. When we, when we first began this work in, in, in different cities, in Bogota, we came across one of, uh, like, some interesting, what we thought were uh, super spreads associated to different corridors that were not being prioritized by, by government interventions because they weren't part of the, of the massive system of Transmilenio. So in Bogota, we have this BRT with the, this rapid bus transit system that, It involves um, like a lot of connections of, of, are we still? Okay, I thought I had disconnected. Uh, so it involves uh, like a, a, a system of buses and they were prioritizing some corridors that were not part of that, that might be highlighted by, by our super spring analysis. And so we conveyed that to the public health authorities and um, they, they did adjust there. It, sometimes it's hard also, like, I, I, I cannot stress enough how important it is for us in the social sciences to, to, to engage in, into this because, because one of the biggest challenges is we have the information, but sometimes we go to decision makers and they have so much trouble on all other subjects that they're dealing with that they don't have the chance to, to think through these type of interventions and so uh, I think it's crucial that we engage from academia without thinking of publishing articles in the first hand, but just like trying to solve the problems. And sometimes that's just like going with the answer to what they need to do. To... Yeah. Well, I mean, your, your analysis and your engagement has been extremely impressive. So <laughs> thank you for that. Congratulations on that. Um, if you're interested in Professor Fahed's work and his teams, uh, I did post a, a link to the work working paper they have in the chat. They have several working papers that you can that you can look up. I think we're at time for now, but thank you so much for joining us today, Professor Fahed. This was a great uh, event, and I think we all learned so much and um, can now think more in our own contexts of of uh, what kinds of interventions to look for. Um, I will just uh, mention that. Uh, we will have this as a video later to share, so that will be circulated. Um, and we do have a couple of future events with the Latin America Center that we're looking at, at, at doing. We'll um, be screening a documentary actually on the Colombian peace process that unfolded uh, either in probably December or January, so stay tuned for that. And we also have one of our own professors, Professor Alejandro uh, Ceron, who is a medical anthropologist here at DU. Uh, in our anthropology department. He'll be speaking in February on his 
work on Guatemala. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today and stay connected with our center. And once again, thank you, Professor Fahed. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to share my work, our work. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. Bye.